Hi everyone, this is Javi Zephyr, a medical student trying his best to explain page by page of the First Aid 2021 US My textbook. In this video, we'll be going through the biochemistry portion, pages 41 to 47. So let's begin. So here in our first diagram, you can see here, it's illustrating how our DNA is transcribed, spliced, and translated into a protein. Let's focus on the cat or tata boxes, which are in the promoter region. And this region is where the RNA polymerase II binds and starts with the help of a start codon, usually AUG, and begins the process of transcription. Once that's done, you get something called a pre-mRNA. Now the reason why it's called pre-mRNA is because you still have introns. And what are introns? Introns are basically non-coding intervening sequences that we really don't need. Whereas the exons, the ones in pink, are used for protein synthesis. So something called the spliceosome, which we'll get to in a minute, splices the introns, leaving the just exons. That's where you get a mature mRNA, which is later released into the cytosol from the nucleus and translated into a protein. Now, if there's a mutation in this promoter region, this commonly results in dramatic decrease in the level of gene transcription. Now let's talk about enhancers and silencers. Enhancers are a DNA locus where regulatory proteins bind, increasing, because they're activating, expression of a gene on the same chromosome. Whereas silencers do the same thing but opposite. They are a DNA locus where regulatory proteins repress, thus decreasing expression of, this, of a gene on the same chromosome. Enhancers and silencers may be located close to, far from, or even within an intron. And basically what these two things do is they regulate the expression of the gene. Now the initial transcript is called the heterogeneous nuclear RNA or HNRNA. And later this HNRNA is modified into an mRNA. And the following processes happen, making an mRNA. First you get capping of the 5 prime end which is the addition of the 7-methylglucosinase cap, the addition of a polyadenylation tail at the 3' prime end, splicing out of the introns, and this leads to a capped, tailed, and spliced mRNA. Like we said before, this mRNA is later translated into the cytosol, and before that happens, we have quality control. And this is basically our cytoplasmic processing bodies, or P-bodies, which contain exonucleases, decapping enzymes, microRNAs, and they clear and clean off the mRNA from any alterations or mutations. Moving on. Now here, for eukaryotes, we have three different types of RNA polymerases. RNA polymerase 1, 2, and 3. Polymerase 1 makes rRNA which is the most common, so R for rampant, and it's only present in the nucleolus, whereas RNA polymerase II makes mRNA, microRNA, and small nuclear RNA. RNA polymerase III makes tRNA, as well as 5S RNA. An easy way to mem remember these is that 1, 2, and 3 enzymes are numbered in the same order that their products are used in protein synthesis. So RNA polymerase 1 makes rRNA, RNA polymerase 2 makes mRNA, and RNA polymerase 3 makes tRNA. Alpha amnitin, which is found in the death cap mushrooms, inhibits RNA polymerase 2, causing dysentery and severe hepatotoxicity. Acetomycin D, also called, a, also called as dactinomycin, inhibits RNA polymerase in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now, in prokaryotes, there's only one RNA polymerase, which is a multi-subunit complex, and this, all, this makes all three kinds of RNA. Now, rifampicins inhibit DNA-dependent RNA polymerase in prokaryotes. Now we have splicing of pre-mRNA. So the primary transcript combines with something called the small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or SN. RNPs, and other proteins to form a spliceosome, which is this right here. And this removes the intron sections, leaving just out the exons, which is 
basically called a mRNA or mature mRNA. Now, if there are any alterations in SNRMPs during assembly, this can cause clinical diseases such as spinal muscular atrophy, or if SNRMPs assembly is affected due to decreased SMN proteins, congenital degeneration of anterior forms of spinal cord leading to symmetric weakness, hypotonia, or a floppy baby syndrome. Anti-U1 SNRP antibodies are associated with SLE, mixed connective tissue diseases, and other rheumatic diseases. All right, moving on. Now we have introns versus exons. Like we said before, introns are intervening non-coding sequences of DNA that stay in the nucleus whereas exons contain the actual genetic information and exit with that mature mRNA and are expressed. Now, different exons are frequently combined by alternative splicing. Basically, alternative splicing can produce a variety of different proteins from a single hnRNA. So basically, once the DNA is transcribed, you get hnRNA, alternative splicing from different spliceosomes can lead to different mRNAs which translate to different proteins. So through one hnRNA, different exons and different splicing can lead to different proteins. Alright, moving on. Now we have tRNA. Now tRNA is basically a 75 to 90 nucleotide long second degree structure which is the shape of a core relief form and it has two three arms, but the two main ones are T-arm and D-arm. T-arm contains ribothyronidine, pseudodiuridinine, and cystidine. And basically this is the part of the arm that tethers tRNA molecules to the ribosome. Now D-arm contains dihydrouridine, and this arm allows detection of the tRNA by amino acetyl tRNA synthase. Lastly is the attachment site, which is ACC coming from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. And this is the amino acid that's the acceptor site. Keep in mind that tRNA basically carries amino acids and helps them get translated with the help of mRNA into a protein. Now that was the structure of tRNA. Moving on to something called charging, this is where amino acetyl tRNA synthase uses one ATP and unique enzymes per respective of each amino acid. And this what it does is basically it matches an amino acid to the tRNA by scrutinizing the amino acid before and after it binds to tRNA. And it's trying to pair up from the codon, anticodon with the mRNA, which we'll discuss further in the next coming pages. Here we have the start and stop codons. Now keep in mind for mRNA, the start codon is always AUG. To keep this in mind, AUG inaugurates protein synthesis, whereas mRNA stop codons are UGA, UAA, and UAG. So remember this, this is a lovely mnemonic you can read here. All right, moving on. So protein synthesis has three main phases, initiation, elongation, and termination. So during initiation, eukaryotic initiation factors, the EIFs, identify the five prime cap. AIFs help assemble the 40S ribosomal subunit with the initiator tRNA. And the EIFs are released when the mRNA and the ribosomal 60S subunit assemble with the complex, and this requires GTP. So you can see here the 40S and the 60S. So basically the eukaryotic initiation factors help bring this all together. Now keep in mind that the 60 and 40S, or subunits of ribosomes, are present only in eukaryotes, whereas prokaryotes have 30 and 50 subunits. To remember this, eukaryotes have even numbers, so 40 plus 60 is 80, whereas prokaryotes have prime numbers, 30 plus 50 is 70. Next is elongation, and three steps occur. Amino acetyl tRNA binds to A site, which is right here, and this requires an elongation factor in GTP. RNA Ribozyme catalyzes peptide bond formation, transferring growth, growing polypeptide to amino acids in the A site. Ribosome advances three nucleotides towards the three prime end of the mRNA, moving peptidyl tRNA to the P site. 
which is right here. This is, this is translocation. Lastly is termination, where eukaryotic release factors, ERFs, recognize the stop codon and halt translation. Completed polypeptide is released from the ribosome, and this requires GTP. To keep this in mind, ATP for tRNA is always activation or charging, like we discussed in the previous page. Whereas GTP with tRNA is gripping and going places or translocation. To help you remember the, the different sites present in the ribosome, you, have, you can think of going ape. A site is for the incoming amino cell tRNA. P site is for the area that accommodates the growing peptide. E site is where it holds the empty tRNA as it exits. Now these are elongation factors present in the elongation phase of, of protein synthesis are targets for the bacterial toxins of either diphtheria and pseudomonas. So again, this part is initiation, that leads to elongation, then termination. Now you have something called as post-transitional modifications, or PTMs. And this refers to the covalent and generally enzymatic modification of proteins following protein synthesis. And this includes phosphorylation, glycosylation, hydroxylation, methylation, acetylation, and others. Something called a chaperone protein, which is an intracellular protein involved in facilitating and maintaining protein folding. In yeast, for example, heat shock proteins are Moving on. Now let's talk about the cell cycle phases. Our cell cycle is divided into the M phase, G1 phase, S phase, and G2 phase. G0 phase being a phase outside of the cell cycle. And this is where cells are usually remain dormant. And the regulation of these cell cycle phases are usually controlled by CDKs or cyclin-dependent kinases, and tumor suppressors. Now this M phase includes the process of mitosis, which, is, which has other stages called as prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Now the regulation of the cell cycle is through cyclin-dependent kinases, CDKs. Now cyclins are regulatory proteins that control the cell cycle events. And these cyclins attach themselves to the CDKs, making cyclin CDK complexes. And these complexes phosphorylate other proteins to coordinate cell cycle progression. And this complex must be activated or inactivated at appropriate times for cell cycle to progress. Then we have tumor suppressors such as P53, which is in induce induces CDK inhibition. And the activation of RB hypophosphorylation, leading to G1 to S phase progression inhibition. Now, mutations in these tumor suppressor genes can result in unrestrained cell division, for example, in Lyme Froman syndrome. Now, growth factors bind to kinase receptors to transition the cell from G1 to S phase. Now, we have different cell types. We have permanent, stable, and lively. Now, permanent cell types remain in G0 phase and they regenerate from stem cells, such as neurons, skeletal, and cardiac muscles, including RBCs. Stable types enter from G1, from G0, when it's stimulated. For example, hepatocytes, lymphocytes, and periosteal cells. Labile never go into G0 and divide rapidly with a short G1 phase, such as bone marrow, gut epithelium, skin, and hair follicles. And this is a type of cell that's most affected by chemotherapy. That's why you lose almost all of your hair during chemotherapy. All right, here's our final page. Now we have something called as rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or RER and SER. Now rough endoplasmic reticulum is the site of synthesis of secretory or exploited proteins and of N-linked oligosaccharide addition to lysosome 1 other proteins. So these endoplasmic reticulum serves many general functions, including folding of proteins, synthesis of ex exported proteins like we discussed earlier, and much more. Now, nissle bodies, which are RER and neurons, 
synthesize peptide neurotransmitters for secretion. Now keep in mind that mucus secreting goblet cells of the small intestine and antibody secreting plasma cells are rich in RAR. And also proteins with organelles such as ER, Golgi bodies, and lysosomes are formed in the RER. Now free ribosomes are unattached to any membrane. And this is the set of synthesis for systolic, sorry, cytosolic, peroxidomal, and mitochondrial proteins. Now smooth endoplasmic reticulum is, is called this because it doesn't have ribosomes on all over it. And this is the site of steroid synthesis and detoxification of drugs and poisons. Now, like, like we said earlier, it lacks surface ribosomes. Liver hepatocytes and steroid hormone producing cells of the adrenal cortex are rich in SER. Now let's move on to something called as the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus is the distribution center for proteins and lipids from the endoplasmic reticulum to vesicles and plasma membrane. And basically here we're adding different proteins to oligosaccharides, modifying their form and function. Now endosomes are sorting centers for material from outside the cell or from the Golgi body, sending it to the lysosomes for destruction or back to the membrane or Golgi for further use, you can see here. Now something called as eye cell disease is an autosomal recessive disorder caused by the deficiency or defect in N-acetylglucosamino-1-phosphotransferase. And this leads to the failure of Golgi to phosphorylate mannose, reducing mannose 6-phosphate. And this leads to the enzyme secreted extracellularly rather than being delivered to lysosomes. That leads to lysosomes being deficient in digestive enzymes. So the, it builds up of cellular debris in lysosomes, which leads to something called its inclusion bodies. This results in coarse facial features, gingival hyperplasia, corneal clouding, restricted joint movements, claw hand deformities, and kyphoscoliosis, as well as an increased plasma level of lysosomal enzymes. And this is usually often fatal in childhood. Now, a signal recognition particle, or SRP, is an abundant cytosolic ribonucleic protein that traffics polypeptide ribosome complex from the cytosol to the RER. Absent or dysfunctional SRP leads to accumulation of protein in the cytosol. Now, the vesicular traffic proteins, COP1 and COP2, are a protein complex that coats vesicles transporting proteins from the cis end of the Golgi complex back to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is COP1, so from Golgi to the ER, whereas COP2 transports proteins in its vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum back to the Golgi apparatus. To remember this, keep in mind that 2, COP2, takes two steps forward in its anterior grade, whereas COP1 takes one step back in retrograde. Now, clathrin is basically a protein that plays a major role in the formation of coated vesicles. And they help with the Golgi body to produce lysosomes, plasma membranes, endosomes, and etc. So you can see here the key for COP1 is sending proteins back from the Golgi apparatus to the ER, whereas COP2 sends proteins from the ER to the Golgi apparatus. All right, I think that's enough for today. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you all learned something from this. Thank you and goodbye.